All right, let's uh, sort of get going here. Just to help me out a little bit with the talk today, um, how many folks here have a, say, hardware engineering background or have ever programmed in assembler? All right. How many folks have no idea at all how a CPU works internally? And really the same people should put their hands up and both get, yeah, okay, good, good, all right, good, excellent. I think he has to be the assembler. Excellent, excellent. Uh, not for any professional experience. No, no, that's, that's fine. So, um, I, I can tell you about three registers. <laughs> CPU with 8 bits works, um, just about, but that's it. Um, Great. So today's talk, um, I'm not going to presuppose any pre-existing engineering knowledge of how any of this stuff works. In fact, my original goal with this talk was literally to explain to someone who knew CSS, and that was it, how a CPU worked. Because at the end of the day, although throughout our careers, frameworks changes, languages change, all these things change, but the reality of it is that everything you write ultimately runs on these little bit of silicone, these little rocks that we have taught to think. And the way those things work has actually not changed appreciably in my career. And I don't expect it to change through the rest of my career. And it probably won't change in your career either. The, there's one thing on the horizon that might totally rewrite the rules called quantum computing. And currently, they can't get that to work at all. So if they manage to, you know, if they manage to come make that happen, that will revolutionize things completely. And we won't even be able to predict exactly how because they can't really get it to work yet. Um, but other than that, you can pretty well bank on the things we're going to walk through today being constant for the rest of your career. And it's good to know because at the end of the day, uh, if you want to make your application perform well or run or, or reliably or understand why some things are the way they are, it all boils down to this hardware. Because at the end of the day, everything you write has to run on a piece of hardware. So whether it's, you know, if it's compiled, it's running directly on the hardware. If it's interpreted, then a thing that runs on the hardware reads your thing and runs it. But either way, somehow, for it to do useful things, it's got to ultimately get translated down to the hardware. So let's, let's break this down. And a, and a favorite technique I like to use to start when you're trying to understand a thing is pretend the thing does not exist. Like, we didn't have CPUs. We, there was no existing designs. We couldn't go down to the corner shop and just buy one. Let's, design, let's do it from scratch. Let's figure out all the pieces we would need to make this work one by one. Okay, so let's start off with just what is our goal. Let's say that as a CPU, what I want to do is I want to calculate things. I want to be able to do a little bit of basic math. I want to be able to say, you know, A plus B equals C. So I have two things, I want to add them together. Most, most trivial thing that we can do. To do that, I need something that understands add. I need to have an A and a B, and I need to have a C. Right? So in the most trivial sense, I want to take A and B, add them together, get C. I need to have this stuff, a little bit of storage for A, a definition of A, definition of B, a place to put C, and a little bit of logic to string it together. OK, it's something, but it's nowhere near a CPU because after all, all I can do is add. And frankly, we could do that without the computer. And not only that, but I'm only adding the same two things together. So let's up the bar a little bit. Let's up it to the point of that little calculator you could get back in the early 80s, the one that looked like an owl, you know, with the little orange, and all it could do is, you know, the basic math operations, add, subtract, multiply, divide. So to do that, okay, I still just need A, B, and C, but I need to make my bit in the middle here a little more clever, right? It's got to be able to know what this operation I want to do and be able to do any of those operations. So that means I need something to tell it which one I want, and it needs to be able to actually do that thing. And for me to have something, a control unit, to tell it what to do, I need to have some way of telling that thing which one I meant. So the, uh, something like an instruction that would say, hey, in this case, I mean divide, or in this case, I mean multiply. So not much more complicated, a little bit more complicated. We've now got an instruction, a control unit, tell our logic unit what operation we want, and we have our A, B, and we have our C. All right, still pretty simple. Of course, if I want to do anything interesting like taking results and then compounding them, I have to start dealing with memory in some way. I need to be able to say, maybe I want either what's an A or something in memory to work on, and then take, take it and add it to the other storage and put it in output to get some new, yet new result. And the minute we touch memory now, okay, 
That means I want to be able to take my results output, put it somewhere in memory so I can, you know, get back to it later, some way of kind of stuffing it off somewhere. And if I do that, I also have to be able to take that memory and get it back into my little working area so I can work on it, right? So I need to be able to take a result and put it in memory. I need to be able to take something from memory and put it into my little scratch pad area so I can work on it. Fine enough, now I've got the basics so I can work on memory in and out. Of course, to do that, I also have to make my control unit smarter because something's gotta set and decide if we're taking input from memory or if we're not, and if so, which one are we putting it into? Meanwhile, it's not that much interesting if all I could do is fix set of things, I really wanna be able to do a variable set of things. I wanna be able to tell it the whole composition of what the instruction is I wanna do. So for example, I wanna be able to tell this thing, hey, work in A or memory, do this operation with this other thing, put the result in memory or keep it in your temporary storage. And, and to do that operation after operation, I need to have some set of storage I use to actually put instructions into. You know, a way of actually having a sequence of instructions to, that I'm gonna execute, or in other words, a program. And if I have that, I need one last little bit of, of connection. I need some way to sort of communicate as we work, okay, get me the next instruction so that I can, in fact, move forward and, and go from step one to step two, step three, step four of actually processing a, a program. So now I have all the pieces we need to be able to do that basic thing up top. Source from a register, from, from a little storage or memory, an operation against another bit of storage and put the result in storage or don't and be able to have the sequence of these things so I can compound results, right? So I can have, do a little bit of math and do more math beyond that and get more math and take the result and have it be meaningful. Now if we take these this pieces here and we just go whoosh, we can actually relabel them to the things that they actually are in a microprocessor. Now for those that are gonna follow me along really carefully and double check my, uh, my work today, we're gonna use Intel x86, uh, 386 assembler, so we're pretending it is 1994, uh, because that still works today. And it's simpler than getting into all of the complexities of, of, and the nuance of some of the newer variations of it. But these are all the same pieces, we've just changed the labels. And we've introduced some terms, and the terms are important, so let me hit those real quick. So we still have just our data memory and instruction memory, like we saw. We have, you'll notice a number of things called registers. In a CPU, every CPU has these little scratch pad areas called registers, and ultimately they're the thing the CPU does work on. Uh, so for example, we have a whole set of registers up here that we can use to have temporary storage to pull into what we do work on. We put the results into a register on the other side. We can then copy from there into memory. We have an instruction register where we store the instruction we are working on, the, thing, the, the next, the, the part of the program that is running right now. Uh, and then we have actually what amounts to another register that t is our little pointer that tells us where we are in that program. You can almost imagine like if I printed out the program as a sheet and I had one of those little like tabs with a little arrow that says sign here and I just kind of kept moving it down the program. That's what this instruction pointer is doing. Now this here is, uh, is a classic architecture. It's not something I invented. Um, and it, it's basically the way that all modern CPUs work. And I say modern, I mean anything um, after basically the round about the uh, Apple IIe timeframe uh, through to now. And it doesn't matter if you're talking about the processor in your phone or in a server in a data center. They all have this and they play around with some of the details. You know, how many of these are there and some other variations of that, but they work like this. Uh, one thing I wanna call your attention to is you notice I say instruction memory and I show data memory as if they're two totally separate things. And you may th think to yourself at the moment, Kendall, that can't be right. I don't recall buying a laptop with eight gigs of instruction memory and eight gigs of data memory. I just bought eight gigs of memory. And that's true. Uh, any modern, remotely modern operating system or any processor running in protected mode takes whatever physical memory you have and basically divides it into these two. And, and the reason for that is really security. That we never want to let something that is data be treated like a program. Now back in the old days of early on assembler, people loved to actually pull stunts 
that make what are called self-modifying apps that would literally rewrite their own code as they went. Not a good practice. It was never a good idea, as a matter of fact. And now any modern machine says, absolutely, you can't do that. And it's, it's really an essential beginning safety feature uh, to make sure that you can't have data suddenly inject itself as instructions. And so any modern operating system has a hard partition between these two. Um, and, and it's interesting because it's one of the reasons we had to go to 64-bit. Because in a 32-bit system, when you say 32 bits, what do we mean? Well, that's 32 bits is four bytes. That's the size of each of these registers. They're all at that, that size. That's sort of what makes that processor that big. It's the width of the data through the processor. Uh, but that also meant that when they were dividing memory up, just through the sheer way memory addressing works, it limited them to two gigabytes of data and two gigabytes of instruction memory, because they divide it in half. Um, and it was one of the first things we ran into was, well, that two gigs is just not enough. And so we had to go to 64-bit to be able to go beyond that. And then it's two, it, the number is now inconceivably large number for this and inconceivably large number for that. The good news is doubling from 32 to 64 through the power of exponents gives us numbers that I am confident we will never hit in my lifetime or yours. Uh, I say with all the confidence of the guy who's waiting to be quoted when that is, turns out to not be true. So, all right, if we have defined the hardware and the basic concept of operation, so we have instructions, we have ability to have a scratch pad sources, put things in a destination, have a thing that does the actual operation. What then do, how do then do we create our programs or program our CPU so that we can do useful things with it and have those things be repeatable across, across hardware? And that comes down to instruction sets. So what is an instruction? An instruction is the, the, basically the thing that we, as an, the smallest thing we as a developer can tell the CPU to do. And when I say small, I mean tiny, because it turns out that these rocks are actually quite stupid. We, um, they are the opposite of us. Computer uh, processors are very stupid, but very fast at being stupid. People are actually relatively smart, but very slow at being smart. And it turns out both are paths you can get real results from as long as you optimize for whichever one you have. So what type of instructions do we actually have in the CPU? So it really boils down to just a few basic things. We've got basic math, which we already saw, you know, add, subtract, multiply, divide. We have binary logic, so this is things like what are called binary ands and ors and xors, and they're useful for really small, fiddly operations inside of the CPU to make things work, and we'll show a little bit of that. We have basic memory operations. It turns out programs spend a lot of time saying, copy the data from here to there, copy it back again, copy not all of it, but just some of it. Uh, things like that. So there's a lot of memory move copy operations. And then we have a stack. And this is one of the really the weird thing that sort of stands out is that we have all these super low level things that are primitives. And then you have this notion of a stack. It's just a data structure that's a relatively advanced data structure. So what is a stack? I want you to imagine for a minute this table. So with, the idea with a stack is the notion of literally stacking sheets of paper on a table. So if I have five sheets of paper and I, put one on, I push one onto the table, it's now pushed onto the stack. If I put another one on, that's now on the stack, and I keep going. So if I go one, two, three, four, five, I've now got five items on my stack. When I want to get something off the stack, it's called popping off the stack, and you get the last thing you put on, back. So if I, if I were to just go push one, two, three, four, five, and then I get pop, I go five, four, three, two, one because it's like a pile of papers on your desk. For me, it's like bills, right? So the last in bills on the top, and you can then I pay that one, goes away in files, now I'm faced with the next bill back, and then unending as they go down towards the desk. It turns out, for many things we do in programming, there's just no way around the computer needing the stack to make other operations work. So it's a high-level data structure that the CPU actually has hardware to have to understand. Other than that then, we have really just a couple basic things. We have two basic things left. We have the ability to jump to a code location. In other words, to say like, okay, I've executed instructions one, two, three, four, and now I want you to go all the way over to instruction 1000 and skip the rest of it. And I can do what's called a subroutine call and, and return. So instead of me just saying, go one, two, three, four, and jump to operation 1000 and never come back, I might say, hey, go to 1000 and then return. And hopefully, hopefully, somewhere over in 1,000 at some point it says, and I'm done, return back. 
Um, if not, my program is in trouble. But this is really basically it. This is all a CPU can do. And if you think about all the things you do in modern programming languages, you're operating way up here and under the covers, a single thing you might ask for might end up under, behind the scenes become thousands and thousands of operations. It's a bit like if you have seen like um, when they build a full-size car out of Lego. Yep, it's a full-size car and it actually is kind of going down the road, but really it's composed of all these tiny, tiny little things. These instructions are the tiny individual Lego and your program ultimately assembles all that stuff up to be a car. Now it'd be really, really um, difficult if you had to kind of always build cars out of things the size of Lego. And that's why we, modern programmers, we work on libraries on top of libraries on top of libraries. It's a bit like going out and getting a whole big thing of Lego pre-assembled and ready to go and dropping it into your, into your construction to make things a lot easier. So these are the categories of, of instructions that we have. Let's rock through some actual examples so you can see just how this works. Let's start with something really simple, a memory move. One of the simplest things that you can do in code is basically set one variable to the value of another variable. So I want to set A equal to B. Now, we're going to show, right underneath that is the, is the assembler code that we would tell our Intel instruction for how to do that. Let's look at this in some detail. So whatever you see, like E something something, that's a register, it's a name of a register in the CPU. So think of it as almost like a bunch of mail slots in, in an office. These are individually named slots. I can put things in, but I can only have one thing in them at a time. So uh, the first thing I do here is I'm actually taking this value and moving into that. Why does assembler work? This goes into that because they feel like that's the way they wanted to write it. There's just conventions and what are you gonna do? Now, I'm not actually taking the value of ECX and putting it in EAX. You notice I've got this little plus four here. So I've got the value of ECX and I'm adding four to that. So I'm doing a little bit of math, constant math, and going into EAX. But there's these pesky square braces around it. The pesky square braces are, are me way of telling the program, I don't want you to take the value of this and just copy it. I want you to go to that place in memory. So ECX plus four, so I've taken the ECX register, I've added four to it, I put the square braces around it, and I'm really saying, hey, go get four bytes of memory starting at the address stored in this, but add four to that address. So we've identified that basically ECX is a number that's pointing off into some place into memory, and then I go and get that value. And then on the other side, I take it from my scratch pad, and I move it back into wherever ECX the value it had, that spot in memory. So if this is my B and this is my A. So the way we've actually, and all my code examples today are gonna to show this, you'll, I, I use A, B, and C a lot. The address of A is, the, is stored in this register just for my code convenience and samples. It's not a convention or a way it has to be, but it's the way I've written my sample. Um, and when you see the square braces, we mean basically treat that as an address and go there. Now, if you're thinking right now two things, one is, is that it takes two statements to do the world's simplest bit of code. Yes, this is why these are very primitive operations that the CPU can do. And two, this seems super fragile. Like, how did I know that B starts four after A? Um, and the answer is, because I do. <laughs> uh, well, it's a little bit better than that. We're a 32-bit processor. 32 bits means that uh, each number is four bytes long, and that's why this is four. Uh, and if I wanted to make this 64-bit code, I'd, pro I'd be probably adding eight right there if those, were, if those were long, and I would have to know that. We code all the time in languages to protect us from this level of, of detail, um, but the detail still exists, it's just our libraries are handling it for us. Let me unpack this address of bit one last time just so we can kind of get a better grip in our head. Let's say that in ECX, I had that little value up there in hex. Um, so it's, it's, um, it's, you know, it, it's, it's an address for me, A. Well, what that point does, that means I go to memory at location A, and I read four bytes, this one, this one, this one, this one, to get my actual value that I want. So this is what I would have actually put off in my register from, from say, going to ECX, find, find that value, and read it out, and put it in. So, this, so when you talk about a pointer, uh, all the time in assembler, we're really saying this is an address that 
Basically, this value points to an address in memory and go there to get what you want and come back. And it's essential because basically otherwise we couldn't really work with anything big in memory at all if we couldn't do these kind of, kind of operations. So uh, at the low level in assembler, we're always dealing with these little pointer things. Now, in your own code, you almost never have to because in fact the libraries are doing this convenient trick for you of basically knowing when you say A, you mean this trick. And, then, and they just handle it under the covers for you. All right. More moving data around stacks, push and pop. So we talked a little bit about what a stack is, and here's a simple example of using a stack. And again, think about a table with sheets of paper. So I have a table, and the first thing I do is I push the, this register onto it, the value of that register. So there's a sheet of, on the table. I go to memory, and I, uh, at ECX, that's my variable A. I put that up on the, on the table. Now if I pop into EAX, I'm getting the top value off. And I'm going putting that back in my register. And then I pop the next item, and I put it into this memory location. So I'm writing back to memory now at that address location. What I've really done here, because I, I pushed, pushed, popped, popped, is I've in fact reversed these two in a very inefficient way. I basically swapped what was in EAX and what was at, in memory at ECX, swapped their positions in a very inefficient way by using the stack. So we use the stack all the time, and we're gonna show some examples of where that goes, but it's, this, it, it's useful because it's this notion of basically let me stuff off an indeterminate number of things in, um, off to let me get back to later and be able to pop back through them. When we're doing math, let's, we saw a little bit of our math instructions, it's really primitive, and we'll start with the beginning. So let's say I just wanna say x equals x plus y, and I've deliberately picked x as being on both sides of this. Well, that's actually pretty easy. I can just say the equivalent would be like add this register and this register. So in this EAX is my X, this EBX is my Y. I say add and it puts the results in the first register. So it's an interesting note that when in, a, in computer assembler, when we actually tell it to do operations and we give it two locations, it ultimately puts the result back in the first location. Why does it do that? Low level hardware reasons, but they all work that way. It's been true for 30 some years. Um, I can also put a move, um, add a constant value, so I can say, hey, EAX, add a constant to yourself and put it back. So these are a single line, they're one of the few things you can do that's really just one line of instruction, one instruction to the CPU to do. It's something that's more interesting, like, hey, I wanna say, take my variable C and make it equal to A plus B. Now in this case, A, B, and C are all in memory. They're like, they're like variables I declared in my program. Well, now you got a problem because you cannot do operations between two memory addresses in any CPU. So if A and B are both variables off in memory, I can't actually just add the two of them where they are. You can't do that. I have to take at least one of them and move them into one of my little slots, the scratch pad areas in my CPU. Then I can add it to, with that other memory to the, to the value in the other memory address. So ECX, that's my A. I move it into a register. I add that register to B, so that's what this guy represents. That puts it back here. I now want to put it out where C is, and that's right here. So the literal what we had to do in assembler was basically copy A into a scratch pad, add that scratch pad to B, take the result and move it to C. So it took three instructions to do A equals B plus C, or C equals A plus B. Either way. Um, and again, we're getting the hint here that CPUs are pretty stupid. We have to be very explicit about what we tell them to do. Now, I don't know about you, but most of my code is not basic math. Most of my code is more like this, or even more complicated. My code is mostly if-thens. And the way CPUs do this is even more entertaining, because they don't actually really do if and then directly. The way it works is, well, first off, you, you basically have to do a compare. So you do a compare, and then we're gonna jump based on the results of the compare. So our initial compare is gonna be, um, I need to compare A and B, and again, I can't do operations between two memory addresses, so the first thing I have to do is copy A into a scratch pad so I can work with it. Then I can compare the scratch pad to B, and then this little guy, JGE exit, stands for jump if greater than or equal to exit. There is no jump less than. 
Why? Because CPU developers love an economy of language. They hate duplication. And after all, a jump greater than is the same as jump less than if you just swap which side you do the compare on. So gosh darn it, they weren't going to implement both of them. You just got to make sure that you do this order here in the correct way so that you can use greater than. Again, stuff you never have to worry about in your code because the compiler is dealing with this for you. So, and it's jumping to exit, which is just some label I've made for the code. In this case, what's really going is I'm jumping around this guy. So, hey, if my compare goes a certain way, then skip the next thing I'm going to do. Otherwise, I need to execute A equals A plus 1, which I can immediately can do just by incrementing a value. A equals A plus 1. Turns out increment is something they built in as a feature in the assembler. And then otherwise, I get to my exit label. So in essence, what I'm doing is um, I, just, I am uh, doing my skip, I'm basically doing a skip over is the way that, that uh, the if logic breaks down in an actual CPU. This is pretty simple though. If A equals less than B, then increment A. That's really pretty trivial. Let's do something a little more entertaining. More commonly, your own code would be something like, hey, if I get this comparison result, then call this function. Jump, you know, I want you to execute this little subroutine. Because without subroutines, frankly, we could never build applications of any complexity. So if A is less than B, then we want to do some more math. Let's, what's that look like? Well, it starts the same as it did before. I've got to get A into a scratch pad, compare it with B, jump greater than or equal exit. That seems suspiciously familiar, because it is. But the thing I'm skipping over is call. When I say, hey, do more math, the actual assembler syntax for that is the, is the statement call. And um, convention is to use underscores to indicate the address of a subroutine. And what literally happens when you say call is you're basically telling the CPU, transfer execution from this instruction to this other address, uh, this other instruction over there. And, and you're really hoping you got it exactly right. Because there's no way for the CPU to know if, you, if you're off by one. <laughs> Because um, it, it's all just binary, so it looks like it's, it's a valid instruction. It may be garbage, may be utterly meaningless, but it's, it is interpretable as an instruction. Um, so it will cheerfully execute it. And if you're wrong, your app will simply completely fail. Or if, you're, or if even worse, the entire computer will simply halt. So, uh, so we say call, do more math, and then otherwise we have our exit label, whatever's next. What's do more math do, our little function? Well. I have it doing something totally trivial here. We're adding to one constant value to the memory address of ECX, which means the value of A. Um, and then we return. Ret is our magic statement to return. Interesting fact, there's no law that requires a subroutine to return. And people, people used to do all kinds of fun development where they would just have one subroutine roll into the next, roll into the next, roll into the next by leaving off return, because you could. Um, and then eventually we'd hit the one return and and roll back. And these are tricks that are terrible, terrible, terrible ideas. And your modern compiler will never generate them. So a little more complicated, but still you might notice do more math. And I've, I've not passed it any variables. I've not done anything with, with, with its response. I just had to do a side effect. I had to add something to location memory. That's not really useful, is it? Cool, fine. We'll get to it. We'll do something a little more complicated. But before we do, I want to jump into what does it mean when we say call and jump? Because it turns out those are called macro assembler commands. They're not actual CPU commands, because that would be too easy. Instead, when we call, we actually have to do a whole sequence of things. The first thing you have to do is we have to save our own state. Remember we have all those little mail slots, and I said only one thing can be in one of those slots at a time? Well, if I'm transferring control to a subroutine, I have no way of knowing what that subroutine is going to do with those slots. It's going to probably want some slots to work on, because it needs to do that to do anything interesting. Uh, and so I have to protect myself, and I basically have to save the state of any slot whose value I care about that's meaningful to me. And I do it with the stack. I push the values of those little guys onto the stack for any uh, register that, that is meaningful to my code. Then I push EIP, that's the register that has the instruction pointer that basically re remembers where I was. I push the base pointer of the stack. We haven't talked about that. So remember I said, hey, a stack, remember, imagine the stack's this table, and I'm putting sheets of paper on top of it. The surface of the table is what's called is the base pointer. It's the bottom of the stack. You can go no lower. 
What we do when we call a subroutine is we basically take the memory address of our base pointer, we save it, and the reason we do that is because we now want to take basically where the top of our stack is and make that the new base pointer. It's a bit like putting a table over our table. We do it because we want to ensure that that subroutine we're calling cannot mess with what we have here on our stack. There's no way it can harm it. So we cheat and pretend like, no, that's, the stack's empty, dude. Uh, see, bare table on top of the other table, but you can't see that table, you get this table. So we, put, we do this to basically save our state and protect ourselves, and then we can finally jump and just transfer control to where that subroutine was. Does that make pop illegal to your subroutine? If they try to pop off the bottom, absolutely, that will fault. Um, good times, uh, because you can't pop below the base pointer. That, well, yeah, and so you've got to know which ones you, you, you care about, and you save all of them. You call push, 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 push. It absolutely can. Oh, so it's beautiful if you think there's an idea of private data. There's no such concept, actually, at this level of things. That's a concept that exists here. We're here. There's no such thing as private data here. It's all just the wide expanse and frontier of bits sitting out there waiting to be plundered. Um, there are some barriers in truth, which is that if I, uh, in a modern operating system, and it's an operating system where the operating system and the chip work together, um, we create a fake memory space if I'm a user application, uh, and I can see all the memory I want that's in my process. I think I'm the only thing running, basically. Um, but yeah, I can, my, my program could go through any of that, could do whatever it wanted to. And if it even wanted to, it can do math on the, the base pointer and manually read the values of the stack behind the table. It just can't move the stack behind the table. Ha! Ah. Now when we return, we have to undo the mess we've made. So when we return, we actually, first thing we do is we take, um, Take our stack pointer, make it the base pointer. We then start popping again to actually start cleaning up what we've done and get back to all the point where we've um, popped back our, our, our register that we saved before. Now these guys here, we pop in the reverse order, we push them so they go back in the right spots. So we do, we do both these guys symmetrically so that we can actually um, safely call a subroutine and then return from that subroutine. When there's variables involved, it gets yet more entertaining. So let's say we want to pass our little function, do more math, and pass it A and B. So to do that then, we have stuff looking pretty much like it was before, just in the call statement side. But until we get to right here, after we've moved the stack pointer and dealt with this stuff, we start pushing more things on the stack. <laughs> we push the arguments that we're passing on the stack in reverse order that they are in the function. So if we said call A, comma B, the first thing we do is push on B, then we push on A, and then we jump to the subroutine. This is how you actually pass variables to a function. And the reason that you go last variable first and work back is it support, makes it easy to implement optional arguments. Because they'll simply be missing, they'll be missing up here, and the program actually does math working back this direction manually reading down the stack, and it, it assumes the program has logic to know not to read beyond into any optional argument that's not present. It basically can read these and know if, if, if a later argument is present and just not go farther than it should. So we do exactly that, and then on the other side, we can act, uh, when we return, we basically do exactly the same tricks because remember here where we basically set the stack pointer and, and saved it for ourselves, we, um, we can pop and move it back again, and now we've basically reset and removed that whole upper table off of our stack, and in so doing, we threw away these extra variables that we'd put on the stack, and anything else that they'd done. So it turns out, in your code, most of the time when you write something and like make a function and you create variables in line, it actually is creating them on the stack down here. Um, and that way they automatically get cleaned up and thrown away basically when you return. I mean, it's all very clean, ish. And it means that if you have multiple levels of things returning, they can clean up each level, can, can roll, uh, roll back and deal with it. So this is all automated and kind of helped out manage for you when you do these two simple commands in assembler. 
because at the end of the day, the CPU is a very stupid thing, and we have to tell it exactly what to do. This stuff itself, this is the, known as the C calling convention. It turns out, for example, on Windows, um, they do get more entertaining things every time you call a subroutine, and Linux does different but yet entertaining things when it calls subroutines. Um, because this isn't just an artifact of the, of the processor, it's actually an artifact of the calling conventions of the operating system as much as anything else uh, to make this stuff work. Okay, so you've seen a bit of the way these instructions go. Let's talk about how they actually get executed by the, by the, by the CPU. Because we've got a notion that we can write a set of instructions to make a program, but how does the CPU execute those instructions to carry out our actions and be the faithful servant we want it to be? So the basics of execution are what's called the fetch-execute cycle. With the fetch-execute cycle, it works like this. We start by fetching the next instruction we're going to run. So that's that get it out of the instruction cycle. We decode it, figure out what it even meant. If it refers to any data we have to go get, like, you know, hey, it's often this address of memory or something like that, we have to go get that data, fetch that data. Then we actually execute the instruction that they wanted to, us to, and write any results back. So we think about our, you know, A equals A plus B. We fetch the instruction, we figure out that they meant A equals A plus B. We go get the values of, of A, you know, out of, out of memory. We do the actual math and then we write the result back into address of A. It's our basic five-step cycle. And if we looked in at the CPU diagram we started with, let's lay that out. So it starts with, here we go, here's our instruction memory. We need to get the next instruction into our instruction register that we meant. That's our fetch. That's the instruction. When we do that, we, move that, we immediately then move the pointer on to the next instruction. So this is always pointing on to the next thing we're going to run. So we fetch it. We decode it, and it means then put the machine into the configuration for it. We get anything from memory we have to do, so there's our fetch data. We actually do the work that they wanted to, and then write the result back if necessary. So there's our five-step cycle. Now keep that image of that flow in your head as we look at then the next piece. Because now we know the cycle, the question is what's the cadence? And the drummer of this particular band is known as the clock. The clock cycle is the thing that keeps the beat for the song for the whole instruction. Every single time, the clock is, actually looks basically like that if you were tracking on a scope. Every single time it transitions from low to high, um, that is the start of a new processing cycle for the CPU. And that's the lockstep of how it works through what it's doing. And the width of this, the, uh, basically the number of times it can do this per second, is our clock rate that we talk about all the time. We throw it all out as the thing of what makes a processor fast. Like This one's much faster, it's a four gigahertz CPU. That one's very slow, it's only a one gigahertz CPU. Who here remembers when CPUs had low digit megahertz you know, ratings, right? So back in the good old days. That should be in your Yorkshireman sketch next time. Kilohertz CPUs. Um, so at three gigahertz, which would be a relatively modern processor, it's going from low to high three billion times per second. And that means that the amount of time in one step of the cycle is 0.33 nanoseconds, okay? 0.33 nanoseconds is about that far. Speed of light goes, light goes about that far in that amount of time. It's a very, very small value. So again, it's very stupid, but it's very fast at being stupid. So, if we then lay out our fetch execute cycle against this, let's see how that, that marries up. We have our instruction fetch, then we decode, then we do our data fetch, then we execute the instruction, right back the results. Tick, 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 working through that cycle on the clock. And then we start the next one, next instruction fetch. What's interesting about this is then it means that to do a whole single statement I gave the CPU, like just saying, hey, increment A or something like that, it actually takes that long to do it, right? Because I have to do, it takes me five steps to do it. So it takes five of those transitions to do just one of those instructions I gave it. And in, and in general, in fact, there's a average amount of, instruction, of clock cycles it takes to do any instruction you might give the CPU, and they vary all over the place uh, in, in, in a modern CPU. But we can, we, here's where we then start getting, having some fun with optimization. Because if you remember the diagram, remember when I went through the diagram and showed you how the hardware was being used, you may have noticed that nothing was lit up for more than one of those phases. 
We literally kind of walked around all the different boxes, lighting them all up in sequence. Now, engineers don't like things that are just sitting around. They want it doing useful work. And so the fact that like the ALU is sitting there doing nothing for four out of five steps, kind of chase. So how can we fix that? Well, we can fix it by doing something called pipelining, where what we recognize is, is that once we have, for example, fetched an instruction, we can go ahead and, while it's being decoded, fetch the next instruction. And once we've decoded it, and we're moving on to execute it, we can then actually be decoding the next instruction, and on and on and on. So we recognize that because we're not using all the pieces of hardware, what we can do is have them work ahead of us. And in so doing, we start doing this trick, we actually can really increase the number of things we do per clock cycle, because we're not doing them one after another, but we're actually kind of doing the bits of work in parallel, keeping all of our chip busy. The only real cuteness trick we have to do is what happens when you execute, and it needs the output of this to um, actually feed into the next execute. Like maybe, for example, this result was referred to by the next instruction. And that's easy, we can add some shortcuts, right? So we basically add some shortcut things that let us immediately feed results back into ourselves um, and use them in the next step. And in so doing, we can, um, we can cheat death a little bit and it lets us try to get to what's sort of the holy grail of processor design, which is you want to, by hook or by crook, get to the point where you're doing one instruction per clock cycle on average. And in fact, a modern desktop chip can average about 1.3 per clock cycle a modern server chip can execute about 1.8 per clock cycle by doing all kinds of death um, tricks like this in how they do the execution cycle, which by the way gets us into real trouble, but that's a subject for another talk. Um, so now let's go and we'll look at just a one little bit of that trouble of how this can get us into it. So we're, uh, we are here going ahead and we're working ahead of ourselves to keep the whole CPU busy. But let's say we need to execute this guy right here. If A is less than B, then add A. Otherwise, I want you to do a different mathematical operation to get a new value of A. So if we think about the assembler, it kind of lays out like this. So here's our full assembler for that. This all is the same as what we did before. There's our increment statement, which we talked about before. Otherwise, now I'm jumping over an else clause. Else, we're adding to this and we're moving to that. Now imagine we're doing our trick where I talk about we execute ahead of ourselves. So this is no problem, here we do this, we've already peeked ahead to start working on the next instruction while we did this. We now start peeking ahead to the jump um, based on the, at, uh, while we're still working on the compare, we realize we can't do anything here. We do not know what the next instruction is after this until that executes, now we're in trouble. So at this point, we have, three, we have a couple of course of action because we can't, we don't know if we're gonna execute this guy or that guy until we do this compare completes. So we don't know which instruction to even start loading. So we can basically do one of three things. We can do nothing, which, in, in, to, which to be fair, it's called a, it's called a pipeline stall. It's what, what initially develop, engineers did. Because after all, it, if you did nothing, well, you're still, as, you're still getting performance removed from pipelining whenever there's enough statements in a row that you don't have to worry about it. So we do nothing, we could, just arbitrarily pick one of them, and as long as we know the outcome of this and whether our choice was right before we permanently alter data, so we can throw away the result if we picked wrong, as long as we do that, we can be safe. And you know what, we have to, if we have a 50-50 shot, we'll, we'll at least keep our performance improvement 50% of the time. Or if we had enough extra hardware, we could execute both. And the difference right there, by the way, is the difference between what your phone does and what a server does. Your phone basically looks at this and does a guess and picks one of them and relies on the fact that before it can permanently change the change data, it'll know whether it was on the right branch or the wrong branch. Modern server chips are designed so that they can execute both sides at the same time because they have enough extra hardware to do that. And not only that, but they can do that through multiple successive if-then operations as sometimes as deep as four, meaning that basically they will, they, they will always be executing the path that they should have executed, they just throw out the other seven, worst case. And that's one of the things that makes those chips big and, and makes them expensive, is, is that ability to do all that kind of thing. Is that what they mean when they say branch prediction? Yeah, so branch, so branch prediction was the idea of, 
either the compiler telling the code, which was the more likely of the two, or the CPU itself noticing that for a particular compare, it tended to resolve one way or the other. And ARM CPUs do the latter. They kind of watch and for a particular thing, they sort of remember that they tend to be either taken or not taken for a particular jump, and they will then do that by default the next time around they come. So there's branch prediction, and there's what's called um, um, I'm going to say a speculative execution is the other technique. It's what the server is doing, where you execute both sides speculatively, and we'll see you know which one we which one we should have win, which one should win, and we go ahead with that. So. Um, so all kinds of tricks that process develop developers do to make, keep these things fast and keep them, keep them moving. Now, I know we're mostly talking about the CPU, but the fact is that you really can't do much with an application if you only are worried about what's literally inside the chip. That chip doesn't exist in a vacuum, it exists inside the world, and even, in, even before networks, the world had disks and it had, you know, it had storage and, and memory and things like that. So. Um, what does it take for us to actually go outside the CPU and work with these things? Well, really early on, we had this example. Move, you know, take, go get the value of A and put it into this register. Under the covers, what this does is actually stupidly complicated. And it starts off with the fact that in a modern operating system, it lies to you about what memory looks like. If you actually go and, and look at the way the, the, the low level ask the machine, it will tell you, for example, on a 32-bit system, I have four gigs of RAM. And in fact, you have four gigs of RAM, nobody else is using any memory. We know that's patently not true. But it does that, it says that. And if you have a 64-bit system, it tells you an even much bigger number, and it's all yours. And the reason it does that is that it's what's called a virtual memory manager, which is that to let us segregate programs from each other um, so that we can do a range of good things, we basically, the CPU itself um, keeps track of and fakes out memory addresses back and forth. So when we have an address in memory, like say, hey, I want to go get A, I can't just go to that location. No, 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 that would be way too simple. Instead, we first have to actually translate that A into, a, um, into, the, into the actual address it would really be on. And it's done as a two-step process. First thing we have to do is look up what's called a page of it, and the reason is that individual bytes are too small to address. To make things efficient, we glom a whole bunch of them together and call it a page, like 8K bytes worth of memory. And then we actually figure out which physical page of RAM really that one is. Uh, because under the covers, the CPUs is creating fakery. And that's why five different programs can all think that they're writing to the same memory address, but in fact not be on top of each other. Um, because the CPU itself knows that what you call A is actually this, and what you call A is actually that. And it keeps them all separated out. So we have this thing called the translation look aside buffer that does this little cheat for us to look it up and keep that value cached so it's very fast to access. And then from that, it can then look at, you look in the, the uh, level one cache in the processor to find out does it have that page of memory or not. And, it, and you'll notice my numbers here. So like, uh, for example, if that was the actual page I wanted and it's this physical page, it starts with a three, then in fact that means it can only be in one of the number three slots here because it's a big warehouse. I have to be able to like know which aisle I'm looking in basically to do it quickly. And I go to the aisle and I look at the two values and hopefully one of them is, is the one I wanted. And if not, I, I miss basically. I, I don't get a hit in my cache. I can't get the value right out. And the reason that this matters, so this is all done kind of for you in the CPU automatically just when you try to go reference something is performance. So if I get a value out of level one cache, and I'm taking these values here for a Intel i7 desktop processor, it has typically about 32K bytes of, of level one cache per core. It takes four clock cycles to get that value out of the cache. And so if I'm at that point, by the way, again, where I'm trying to get that piece of data, um, well, we're just waiting, you know, four clock cycles until I can get that out of that first level cache. If it's not there, I have to go up to the next cache, the level two cache, and that one is bigger but slower. And this becomes the trend we start seeing. Now it's 12 clock cycles to get it out of the level two cache. Let's say I get a miss there too. It's neither of these two guys. So it's even worse. I have to go to the much bigger uh, level three cache. This, by the way, when you go look at a CPU spec and it talks about cache size, they're talking about the level, the, the topmost cache. Um, which is the last one that's inside the processor. 
And here it's 36 clock cycles. So you can see that we've gone from four to 36. That's pretty dramatic, but we're still hitting cash. Let's say that it is not our day and we actually have to go all the way out to main memory. And let's say that we are a workstation machine so our main memory is actually quite fast. It still takes 200 clock cycles to get a value out of main memory. And this becomes the real story and the challenge of what makes hardware work, is that you wanna make an application fast. It's not about making the instructions themselves fast. It's about working with memory correctly. Because if you can live in the, like these caches down here, memory accesses are quite fast, right? That was uh, 12 clock cycles. You have to go all the way out to main memory, it's 200 clock cycles. Now that may, it may seem pretty fast, but let's, let's scale our time a bit so we get a real sen better sense of what that means. So if in my three gigahertz CPU, one clock cycles 0.33 nanoseconds, let's just arbitrarily pretend it was one second. Because a second's a unit of time, we can get our head around how long a second is. Well, if that's true, then to access level one cache takes three seconds. To access main memory takes 3.3 minutes. We'll be into questions time almost by the time that we can get a value back from main memory. Now, if it's not there and I actually have to go load it off disk, let's say that at least I have an SSD, it will only take me a couple of days. We'll all be home by the time that data comes back. Worse yet, if you're still using a machine that has one of those spinning rust hard drives, um, there will be an entirely new set of JavaScript frameworks by the time that data comes back. Finally, if we have to make an internet call uh, from here to San Francisco, um, we literally all, of, there's not a technology we otherwise talked about today that will still be current by the time you would get that data back, right? So the point here is that if you think about your own source code and you're worried about optimizing your little individual steps up here and then like one of those operations is and call San Francisco, which one do you think you need to worry about? Calling San Francisco, right? Because that so dwarfs everything else going on up here that these bits don't matter. And it, as a developers, we tend to make a mistake and think lines of code is directly equal to performance. As I see lines of code, they, you know, they each take about the same amount of time. And it's just simply not the case for the way this stuff goes. Okay, so we've talked a little bit about how things get out of the CPU. Let me hit one last fun bit. So, and I particularly, this is fun to talk about in the UK, because the UK is the home of ARM. That's right. So um, when I was starting my career, there was an assumption. This is right around when the Pentium was the thing. There was an assumption everybody had, including Intel, that the way we'd been building chips forever was about to die. What, was, what became known as the CISC processor was about to die. And what was going to wipe them off the face of the earth was RISC processors. From companies like MIPS, Alpha, uh, Arm really wasn't a thing really yet. They formed later. Um, and, and others. And we, th we were so sure about it. In fact, Intel was so sure about it, they started themselves inventing their own replacement tech, two different separate replacement chips uh, based around this theory. How do we get here Wh and why did this happen? Well, let's go wind the clock way back to the first CPUs. Way back when, when these things were first created, compilers were super primitive and that meant that they couldn't do much optimization. And the physical act of calling a subroutine, remember all those steps we had to do to call a subroutine? And there was a whole bunch of lines of things. Now imagine that your computer took real measurable time to do each instruction because they were measured in like one megahertz machines back then. Uh, calling subroutines was very expensive and the compilers weren't very good. And that meant at the end of the day, if I could bake it into the hardware, it would be fast. If not, it was slow. And so there's a lot of pressure to pack everything we could into the hardware itself to make the machines quick. And that culminated in groups like uh, Digital Equipment Corporation with their VACs, putting things like polynomial factorization into the actual uh, physical hardware, which never worked out. And that became the moment pretty much everyone said, that doesn't work, we can't do that anymore, that's crazy. But it was in the initial piece of pressure we had. The other thing that started influence stuff is that, as you, you, is that instructions have different lengths. So like a simple return statement, that's one byte long. If I want to move a constant into a register, that's five bytes for that instruction. And it could be as long as 10 on an Intel uh, x86 assembler. And what this means is that you don't know, for example, how, if you've read the whole instruction until you've decoded the instruction, which slows down your ability to keep doing things in that fast pipeline fashion one after another. Worse yet, 
How long it takes for an instruction to run varies dramatically. A simple return that has no data that it has to deal with, that's running from cache, takes 24 clock cycles to run, to return from a subroutine. Moving a constant into a register is really fast, one clock cycle. Doing a multiplication with a constant, three clock cycles. Interesting enough, doing a divide of the same, same two arguments, 79 clock cycles. This is still true today. Divides are super slow, multiplies are fast. If you can do it in a multiply, it's faster. In fact, some compilers are smart enough to figure out when that's possible and translate divides into multiplies. For why, it goes into arcanery of how hardware is actually built, a discussion I could ha I'm going to have with you at PubConf tonight, which you all should go to. So, this got us to where a whole team said for and said, we can't continue working this way. We've got to do better. So they came up with this idea of risk. And the idea was that instead of having variable length instructions, we're going to make them fixed length, so four bytes long, 32-bit. We're going to try to get them all to execute about the same per cycle, which means that we're going to take some complicated instructions and break them into multiple instructions to force them to try to execute in roughly the same amount of time so that they can be pipelined more efficiently. Um, and one of the reasons, one of the reasons we're going to do that to prevent stalls is we're not going to let you ever actually directly work with memory. You always have to pull it into registers or push it back explicitly so that you, the compiler will have to optimize those sequences for you. And again, it gets us into more consistent execution times. And they basically created this set of rules to define these two. And in the end, it really did work to improve efficiency in a number of ways. How did it work out? Well, when you have simpler options, you end up with a lot fewer transistors to actually make up the chip. Fewer transistors mean that your chip itself is physically much smaller and needs less power. When you have shorter operation durations, you get higher clock speeds with less power required. And that constant operation duration gives you that efficient pipeline to run with. In the end, it means that you have more reliable hardware that's smaller and uses less power. If you think, interesting thing about it though is that basically ARM almost died before any of this mattered. In fact, MIPS and a bunch of these folks died before this stuff mattered because it turns out that as long as I have access to mains power, these advantages don't really matter much as long as manufacturing can affordably produce the chips. Um, where it really matters all of a sudden is mobile phones. Because per watt of energy, an ARM CPU, which is uh, pretty much all RISC CPUs in the world now are ARM, and, and everything else is Intel, <laughs> pretty much, um, they do a tremendous amount with that one watt of power. But there's an upper bound that they can do. So a four gigahertz ARM chip will never be able to compete with a four gigahertz server chip from Intel. But it uses one, actually one ten thousandth the power to do it. Now plugged into mains with access to plenty of cooling, you don't care. In your pocket to get all day battery life, you care a lot. And ultimately that's why what's in your pocket is, an, is a RISC chip, and what's in your laptop and in your desktop and in the servers is a CISC chip. All right. A big reason that they were sure it was gonna take over the world was because we were, a, we were reaching the um, density of manufacturing where we couldn't cram more transistors into a chip without dropping clock speeds. And we were reaching the limit of what was called X-ray lithography that they used to make them. We were actually reaching the frequency of X-ray. And so the thinking was, this is it. It's a physical limit. We'll never be able to beat it. So we're gonna have to kind of go laterally to get around it. And again, like in almost every case of engineering where this has come up, never underestimate the value of just um, repetitive optimization of a process. So they came out with um, ways to do basically multiple x-ray diffraction. You look at the interference patterns and to get down from like 60 nanometer processes down to six. And once they've, as they've done that, it's just blown away any reason for it to matter. So. So why, why do not desktop computers use RISC processes like top at 200 gigahertz? So the speed of light fundamentally, remember I said light goes this far in, in about that length of time. A, ch a physical chip, has to be sm small enough that as the clock moves around, the whole state of the, of the chip is physically consistent. So there's basically a direct correlation between clock speed and the size of the, of the, of the core. And it's the other reason why we have big multi-core systems instead of gig gigahertz rising, because you can take the same chip and put four cores on it, and then you only have to have each individual core stay consistent, and they stay within that one centimeter size that lets them work at, say, three, gig three gigahertz or more. But you'd have to keep making the chip smaller and smaller, smaller as you rev those clock speeds to have the whole chip run within the 
uh, basically be together on the same clock cycle because of the speed of light. The alternative is to come up with a much faster speed of light. <laughs> so, okay, let's wrap it up. CPUs do simple things very fast. Humans do complicated things very slowly. Two different ways of getting to results. The instruction sets determine compatibility, and that Intel instruction set and compatibility is the big reason Intel still lives on the CISC world, because the ability to today still run a program that was written in VB6 back in the 90s matters to a lot of people with a lot of money. Even RAM is super slow compared to the cache in the CPU, which means that if you want to make your program faster, the number one thing you can do is have it run in less RAM. Overwhelmingly, the number one thing you can do is have it run in less RAM. We use risk chips where we need, where we value small, uh, low power, and also that means cool chips. And we use CISC where we need consistent, fast performance. Thank you very much. I really appreciate the opportunity to speak at NDC. And um, so here's some content inf info for me. I'm on Twitter all the time. Otherwise, there's my email address. And uh, thank you very much for uh, attending. Any other questions while we're... Uh... Yeah, yes. Sorry? Uh, I have a question about uh, the old uh, CPUs in Amiga and Power right. PC 68000. Okay, so the Power PC was a wrist chip. It was one of the first wrist chips. The Amiga ran from a 6803 to 6040, which was a CISC chip built by Motorola. Um, and the Power PC was actually an IBM design that Motorola could help them with. Um, and it was intended, in fact, PowerC was assumed to take over the world from the 1600, 3060040s because that, that transition from sys to risk. Um, and so they were, you saw much higher, giga, much higher clock speeds. Um, they had a lot more registers, um, but they couldn't do some other things as well, but they were, um, but they were very fast. And you actually saw the 1600, 3060040s last a long time in videography work, like video production work because they were very consistent in their performance, more consistent than the PowerPCs were. They were very fast, but they could stall. And in video, we're doing real-time video work, stall bad, like really bad. So you have to be able to absolutely hit those frames of resolution exactly as you go. And, and the 60 or 30 or 40 were better at that. So they were also available in military hardened configurations, which the others, but that didn't matter for video work. Eight yes, right. Oh, all, all eight of them. I want all eight of them. So that's like, well, there's a question over here. Um, yep. That was an out. That's, that's right, in, so SIMD instruction, well, so the ability, let's do hyper-threading. What, what Intel did actually is they were adding extra hardware to make sure that they could never stall the pipeline. They realized they ended up with extra hardware that was sitting around when the pipeline was not being stalled. And there was the instructions conveniently order themselves such that you didn't have a stall scenario and didn't need that extra hardware. So they then turned around and said, okay, but wait a minute, why don't we put it to use by creating, letting a second virtual thread of execution run at the same time in the same core. Um, and, but we'll just deprioritize it so it will stall first before the main one stalls, and then we'll let the main one go. And that's why they're identified as primary and second. Yeah. Well, so, okay, so you have, you have I skipped over a bunch of the multitasking stuff, so there, because you just don't have time in a talk like this. Um, yeah, so when you're doing multitasking, uh, just in general, you have to, every time you switch context, so you're switching either from user mode to system mode, you, you pay a penalty of security for it to deal with stuff, and every time it suspends a thread of execution, it has to copy, and in fact, it's a lot much worse than we, I showed up here. I have a, uh, I'll show you my, my quick slide on that. Um, it's astounding, actually, how bad it is to do a, uh, a suspend and resume. So, um, yeah, so if we use our one second scaling for a one second clock cycle, to, to context switch between two threads of execution on the same physical core takes the equivalent of, of 16 minutes. Yeah, on, on a Windows operating system, a little slower on a Linux operating system. Because Windows NT was actually designed for high number of thread concurrency from the get-go. Linux, being a Unix system, threading came pretty late to Unix, and because you just forked more processes, so it was optimized for multiple processes over multiple threads. So, um, if I was in task manager in, in, in Windows right now, mm -hmm. my laptop, I can see, uh, say, about 120 threads. Uh, right. Processes right, right. And almost all of which are stalled and not running. So they're, they're paying a 16 minute cost all the time. Yes. So, so basically, if I had a processor that had hundreds of cores, it would actually make my position much 
absolutely, absolutely. So physical cores beat that, and yeah, you over scheduling, having too many threads, is also the fastest way to per, actually. It is the fast way to performance death because not only do you have the taxation of, of switching threads, what's even worse than that is those threads are working in different parts of memory, which means that they're going to tend to cause cache hits to go down, and you're going to tend to fall back to main memory and other expensive access reads. So absolutely, the fast way to kill a system is with too many threads. So with that, I'm going to have to yield the mic and let go of the lectern. So, but I'll be around if there's any other follow-up questions. I really uh, love the discussion. Thank you. Well, then you're not doing any useful work. <laughs>